When they knew God, they glorified him not as God. Neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like the corruptible man, into birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Wherefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie, and worship and serve the creature more than the Creator, who was blessed forever. Amen. For this cause, God gave them up unto vile affections. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burning their lust one toward another, men with men, working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error, which was me. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, backbites, haters of God, despite, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. Reprobate silver shall men call them, because the Lord hath rejected them. What does the word reprobate mean? Well, in Jeremiah chapter 30, or 6, verse 30, the Bible says, Reprobate silver shall men call them, because the Lord hath rejected them. So the Bible's likening these people to silver, who in the previous verses, it talks about the billows, it talks about the fire, all the dross has gone out, but it's still like this, this silver, even though they've burned it with fire and melted it down, it's still worthless. And the Bible says, just like the, he's likening this people to that silver, and he's saying, it is silver that's just, it's just good for nothing, you should just throw it away, it's rejected. And it's saying, reprobate silver shall men call them, because the Lord hath rejected them. Reprobate silver is silver that's been rejected by the refiner. A reprobate person is somebody that's been rejected by God. When the Bible speaks about reprobate, it emphasizes the mind of a reprobate. Are you there in Romans 1? Look at verse 28. And as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate. Notice, it doesn't say soul. It doesn't say body. It, does, it says, he gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. Go to 2 Timothy chapter 3. Let's look at the next mention of reprobate. Reprobate. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 7. The Bible reads, Ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Pay attention to that statement. Ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now, as Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. There's your reprobate mind, right? They're men of corrupt minds. What's their mind like? Their mind is reprobate concerning the faith. Okay, so what does a reprobate mind look like according to this verse? It's someone who's ever learning, but never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. What does it mean to not be able to come to the, it means you can't. You cannot come to the knowledge of the truth. Why? Because you've been rejected. You're saying the blood of Jesus Christ doesn't wash away every sin. I'll give you two answers to that. Number one, the Bible says if you blaspheme the Holy Ghost in Mark 3, if you say that Jesus had a devil, you're, you're, you're a reprobate. There's, that's not, it's an unforgivable sin. Put that in your pipe and smoke it. That's what the Bible said. Amen. That was the word of Jesus Christ in red, okay? Number two, you say, does Jesus uh, forgive Sodom my acts? The answer is yes. Let's say somebody coerces. The Bible says in Habakkuk 2.15, Woe unto him that giveth his neighbor drink, that putteth thy bottle to him, 
and makest them drunk, and also that he may look upon his nakedness. Talks about somebody getting somebody drunk and coercing them into doing a sodomite act. Now let's say, let's flip, let's use a different saying. Let's say adultery. Let's say a guy sees a married lady and she's all by herself, and he gives her a few drinks. She her guards let down. And she commits adultery. It's still adultery. It's still wicked. She still is in sin. She can't say I was drunk. She was in sin. It's a wicked act. The Bible says put to death. If somebody coerces somebody into being to doing some wicked act, it does look, and I'll get into it, but I'm just gonna say it right now. Committing sodomy, a sodomy act, does not make you a reprobate. They were a reprobate. They were given up way back when. Being a reprobate, being a total sodomite, loving the sodomy and all that stuff, that is something that's just a, a symptom of being a, of a reprobate. That's just one symptom. You know, I refuse to use the term gay. Because the term gay is used in the Bible just ab about someone who's happy or, or cheerful, okay? This is something that's considered strange in the Bible or sodomite. So those are the words that I'm going to use, queer or sodomite. I'm not going to use the world's term. But let me tell you something right now, and I'm just going to warn you right now that many people are going to find the sermon that I'm going to preach right now very offensive. People are going to be offended by it. And you know what that tells me? That just tells me that the brainwashing's going really well. Right. TV and Hollywood and, and the music industry have done their work because everything I'm going to preach tonight is directly from the Bible and it's going to offend a lot of people, but ask me if I care. Because you know what? The Word of God is crystal clear on this subject. I'm going to be crystal clear on this subject. And people are going to be offended because they have been taught by Hollywood and taught by the mainstream media and they've been taught by the music and the TV shows that homosexuality is a normal alternative lifestyle and that they are normal people. That is not what the Bible teaches anywhere. In San Francisco, LGBT history is all around, but state school officials today adopting new guidelines, making the history part of classroom lessons in all California schools. At Our Family Coalition, a group representing LGBT families, Jennifer Grant says she's excited. Her 15-year-old twins will learn about the movement for gay marriage. They were at my wedding to my wife, but they have no understanding of what, how, who fought for that and how we got to that point. The law to include LGBT history passed four years ago, but budget cuts in opposition, like this petition against it, stalled the plan. Now California public school curriculum will include lessons in second grade about diverse families. In fourth grade, students will learn about California's place in the gay rights movement. In fifth grade, eighth grade, and high school, students will learn about gender roles in the 18th and 19th centuries and examples of individuals who flouted them. In the classroom, students will learn about prominent LGBT historical figures throughout the world. Perhaps they'll learn about someone like Oscar Wilde, the Irish writer. We may not agree with all the history or the experiences. We may embrace some of it, but I really want my children, and I would hope all parents would want their children, to learn about everything that's out there and then make up their own minds. The latest victory in the gay rights movement now in the classroom. And I'm going to show you a pattern in the Bible here. When the Bible talks about this subject, it's always the same old story playing out. You see, in Genesis 19, you have a city that is filled with these homos, with these sodomites. And these men in the city, instead of contenting themselves to just be a homo or get married to each other or whatever they want to do, what do they want to do? They want to go after the two guys who just got into the town. The two innocent visitors who march into town and they say, we want those two guys, the whole town's there. They say, we want to bring those two guys out and we want to know them. And you say, oh, they, they just want to have a loving relationship. Okay, if they want to have a loving relationship, then why is it that when Lot tells them no, they say, we're going to do worse to you than what we were going to do to them. Does that sound like they were going to do a good thing to them or a bad thing? Well, because worse is the superlative of bad. And they said, we're going to do worse with you than what we would have done to them. And turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an ensample unto those that after should live ungodly, and delivered just Lot, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked, 
For that righteous man dwelling among them, in seeing and hearing, vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptations, and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. But chiefly, them that walk after the flesh in the lust of uncleanness, and despise government. Presumptuous are they, self-willed. They are not afraid to speak evil of dignities. Whereas angels, which are greater in power and might, bring not railing accusation against them before the Lord. But these, as natural brute beasts made to be taken and destroyed, speak evil of the things that they understand not, and shall utterly perish in their own corruption and shall receive the reward of unrighteousness, as they that count it pleasure to riot in the daytime. Spots they are, and blemishes, sporting themselves with their own deceivings while they feast with you, having eyes full of adultery, and that cannot cease from sin, beguiling unstable souls, and heart they have exercised with covetous practices, cursed children, which have forsaken the right way and are gone astray, following the way of Balaam the son of Bosor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness, but was rebuked for his iniquity. Go to Judges chapter 19. Judges chapter 19. Now it's interesting also when, when Lot tries to rebuke these men, and he says, do not so vile a thing. Do not such a wicked thing. When he tells these men, you know what they say to him? Oh, this guy came in to sojourn among us and he'll be a judge now. So what are they accusing him of doing? Judging. And isn't that the same thing today? When you try to preach the word of God and when you show what the Bible teaches about the subject of sodomy, people will say this, you're judging, you're judgmental. Well, what do you say we turn to the book of Judges? I mean, it seems like a great book to go when we're dealing with this subject. You know, the only time I see somebody telling you, oh, you're judging, you know, they were the ones who were guilty of this wicked sin. And they, oh, you're judging. Look at Judges 19.22. We find a very similar story. Here's a guy who's traveling with his concubine or his live-in girlfriend and a servant. And he shows up in a town. It's a similar story, except in this story, he's trying to find a place to stay. He can't find anywhere to stay. Well, an old man comes in from the field and says, I will let you stay at my house, but you guys should not spend the night in the street. Very similar story. Look at Judges 19.22. Now, as they were making their hearts merry, so they're having dinner, they're laughing, they're having a good time. It says, as they were making their hearts merry, behold, the men of the city, certain sons of Belial. Okay, now the term Belial is like Baal, Bel, Beelzebub. It's basically a term for Satan. And it says, certain sons of Belial beset the house round about and beat at the door and spake to the master of the house, the old man, saying, Bring forth the man that came into thine house that we may know him. Does this sound familiar? This is several hundred years later. And the man, the master of the house, went out unto them and said unto them, Nay, my brethren, nay, I pray you, do not so wickedly, seeing that this man has come into my house, do not this folly. Behold, here is my daughter, a maiden, and his concubine. Them I will bring out now, and humble ye them, and do with them what seemeth good unto you. But unto this man do not so vile a thing. Notice that word vile. But the man would not hearken to him. So the man took his concubine and brought her forth unto them. And they knew her and abused her all the night and until the morning. And when the day began to spring, they let her go. Then came the woman in the dawning of the day and fell down at the door of the man's house where her Lord was till it was light. And her Lord rose up in the morning and opened the doors of the house and went out to go his way. And behold, the woman, his concubine, was fallen down at the door of the house and her hands were upon the threshold. And he said unto her, Up, and let us be going. But none answered. Then the man took her up upon an ass, and the man rose up and got him at his place. She's dead. Now you say, well, this isn't a very pleasant story. This isn't a very pleasant sermon. No, it's not a very pleasant subject. But this, my friend, is reality that you're seeing tonight. You see, what you see on TV is a lie. What you hear in the music is a lie. What you see in the Hollywood movie is a lie. This is the truth. And when you come to church, you should expect to hear the truth about every subject. And tonight, you're going to hear the truth about the sodomites. Welcome to World News. A 30-year-old man is facing multiple life sentences after being exposed as one of the UK's worst ever pedophiles. 
Richard Huckle posed as an English teacher as he abused as many as 200 children from deprived communities in Malaysia. His youngest victim was only six months old. The Old Bailey in London heard that he filmed himself raping children and even wrote a guide for others on how to get away with it. Detectives discovered 20,000 indecent images on his computer. Huckle appeared in a promotional video for the British Council in Malaysia, where he took a short teacher training course. He taught English and Bible study to the children of a poor community there. But secretly, he raped babies, toddlers and teenagers, girls and boys, systematically over many years. He's only just turned 30. Huckle's sister-in-law told me, None of his family will speak about him. None of us ever want to see Richard again. A lot of people want to know this. Why do y'all refer to homosexuals as predators and pedophiles? Now, it's pretty clear if you read the Bible, Genesis chapter 19, Judges chapter 19, I'm not going to go into it. Every time you see them in the Bible, they're praying on somebody. All right? The Bible says in the book of Habakkuk that they actually even give strong drink to people to drug them up so they can uncover their nakedness and take advantage of them. All right? This is what they're made, this is what they're made of. This is what they're all about. And guess what? If the Bible, if, 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 if the Bible picked... See, you've been brainwashed by will and grace, and you've been brainwashed by Hellavision. I'm trying to brainwash myself to reality by the King James Bible. All right, the King James Bible paints them as predators. And look, predators go after easy prey. They're going to go after the easiest victim they can find, and there's nobody easier than a child. They don't reproduce, so they have to recruit. It's for their survival. All right, they recruit kids, they go, and they like going after fresh meat. It's the same thing in Genesis. They, they went after some fresh meat. Same thing in Judges 19. They're going after some fresh meat. And here's how I'll prove to you that they're pedophiles. In Genesis chapter 19, the Bible says, young and old surrounded the house. Where do you think the young people came from? They got recruited. They got messed with. Now, I'll give you more proof that they're predators and they prey on kids. Romans chapter 1, the list of things that reprobates are filled with, it says one of them in there, disobedient to parents. That means there's young children who are reprobates. They got preyed on, they got messed with. And, and, and they rejected Jesus Christ and went over to their side. Now, the Bible proves it. Nambla proves it. Anybody know what Nambla is? When I was in the military, we used to have to donate. To confine, com, we, they would ask us to donate to these charities. I took my book, my charity book that the government put in my hand for a government. I could get a tax write-off for donating to this charity. Nambla. North American Man Boy Love Association. A group of filthy, stinking perverts who want to petition to have the age of consent lowered from 18 to 12. They prove it. They prove they're pedophiles. Uh, Hollywood proves they're pedophiles. You ever heard of Corey Hain and Corey Feldman? Go listen to one of their testimonies sometime about how they were passed around like rag dolls and raped and everything else by them bunch of freaks. Catholic priests prove it. 60% of Catholic priests, I've read statistics where 60% of Catholic priests are homos. And I read some figures recently that said there have been over 17,000 children have come forth from 1950 to 2015 of children that were messed with by Catholic homo priests. And that's just the ones that came forward. Is it any question that they're pedophiles? <clears throat> now, they have a saying, eight before it's too late. If they can expose themselves to a little boy in a restroom somewhere or mess with a little boy somewhere and get in his brain and get in his mind and mess with him, they feel like they can recruit him over to their side. If they can get him for his eight, they got him. And you wonder why we don't want him around our children. You wonder why Jesus gave you a specific command, give not that which is holy to dogs for these children's sake. And these Baptist preachers are opening up the doors to them all across the country and they're blocking in. 
Well, Denise, this is literally a case that's pitting brother against brother. On one hand, you have one son who's describing in detail some of the graphic, you know, alleged sexual abuse that happened at the hands of his two fathers. Well, on the other hand, his own blood brother is saying none of that is true. Now, let's go ahead and take a look at video just shot moments ago. The two men at the center of it all are George Harans and Douglas Worth. Here they are leaving the courthouse together moments ago. They had no comment for us, and they adopted nine children in all. Some of them are accusing the couple of doing the unthinkable. We're talking about rapes, locking children in cages, and many more things just too graphic for TV. Now, you say it's an unpleasant sermon. Of course it's an unpleasant sermon. We're preaching about the sodomites. It's an unpleasant subject. The fact that, like, I had molested all these kids, basically. Like, wow. If anybody finds me out, I'm in a lot of trouble. I molested them. I molested them. I molested them. It's the youngest dude you ever got with. To my age, like, different? Yeah. Say, well, what have we learned so far tonight? Well, number one, we learned that reprobate means rejected, right? We saw how that played out where God darkened their heart, blinded their eyes and so forth, and therefore they could not believe. So people say, wait a minute, are you telling me that if a sodomite believed, they'd be saved? Well, if anybody believed, they'll be saved. But here's the thing. Once you've been given over to a reprobate mind, you can't believe because you've got a hardened heart and a darkened understanding. And the Bible tells us that those who are men with men didn't even want to retain God in their knowledge. That's why God even gave them over to a reprobate mind in the first place. So let me ask you this. How can a person who doesn't, they hate God so much, they don't even want to remember that he exists. They don't even want to retain him in their knowledge. How, how is that person going to confess with their mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in, it, in their heart that God raised him from the dead? If they did that, they'd be saved. But how can they when they hate God? The Bible says they're haters of God, that they didn't even want to retain God in their knowledge. But we're supposed to believe that they're going to believe on Jesus and call upon him? How can they when they hate him, when they don't even want to remember he exists? If a man also lie with mankind as he lieth with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. You know, God gets to the end of, of Romans 1, the quintessential passage on reprobates. He's talking to them about reprobates. And he gets to the end and he says, there's only one thing to really do with these people. And a responsible society would do it. And I'm not saying that we should go out and do this. I'm saying a, a, a society, a government would do this if they actually wanted to protect their people. They are worthy of death. Amen. That's the only way you fix a reprobate. You take their lives. That's what the Bible says. Amen. That's what the Word of God says. Amen. That's what should be done. Titus chapter 3 and verse 5. Should we reach out to these people? Titus chapter 3 verse 5. I'm sorry, 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 5. 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 5. Should we reach out to these people? Should we go out and try to get them saved? People tell me, I'm going to go out and get a sodomite saved. Is that something we should be doing? You can't get a sodomite saved. Look, if, if, if they're given over to that sin, it's because they've got no conscience. It's unnatural. We'll talk about that tonight. 2 Timothy 3 5. Second to me three times. Having a form of godliness. Well, well I, I gave the gospel as homosexual and he got saved. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. He said, what do you do with them? From such turn away. Listen to me. That's why we don't, we don't believe in the born that way ministry. 
That's why we're not going to bring them in. We're not going to bring, well, we should bring in the homosexuals and we should minister to them and we should love. No, from such, turn away. That's what the Bible says. Leave them alone. That's what Jesus said. We don't minister to them. There's no hope for them. They're worthy of death. From such, turn away. Go to 2 Peter chapter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 12. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 12. You say, what do you do? What do you do with a, 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 with a reprobate? What's there to do? There's no hope. There's nothing to do. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 12. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 12. But these, as natural brute beasts, notice how the Bible calls them animals. They're not human anymore. But these, as natural brute beasts, as stupid animals, made to be taken and destroyed, speak evil of things that they understand not, and shall utterly perish in their own corruption. You say, what, what, should you, what do you do with a reprobate? You know, they're made to be taken and destroyed. That's really all you can do. And again, we don't do that. That's not our job. That's what society should do. That's what government should do. But that's what God says. He says they're worthy of death. Uh, I think we have a new questioner in the back here. Um, I'm just reading from your essay about homosexuality. Uh-huh. You say it's a totally unnatural behavior. Yes. Sure, and, and actually I, I think that a better word, than, and I know I use the word unnatural, but I think a better word is the word that the Bible uses, which is against nature, okay? And basically, all of us are born with a certain uh, nature, okay? A sinful nature. For example, my, my children, I don't have to teach them how to lie. I have to teach them to tell the truth, okay? Because they're born with a nature that basically when they get in trouble, they're gonna lie to cover it up. For example, it's, it's, it's part of our nature as men to lust after another woman, okay, that we're not married to. Well, that's a sin, according to the Bible. It's part of our nature to be tempted to steal things that we want that don't belong to us. So we are born sinners. That's why we sin all the time. You know, we have to make an effort to do what's right, okay? That doesn't come easily to do what's right. Now, homosexuality is not part of that sinful nature, okay? Because, for example, I'm tempted to do all manner of sin. And, for example, I'm driving down the road, I see a billboard, there's a girl in a bikini. The temptation is going to be for me to look at that and lust after that. It would be a sin for me to do so. I have to tell myself, hey, the Bible says no. You know, don't look at that. You know, keep my eyes on the road, not look at that uh, wicked image. Okay. But if I'm driving down the road and there's some guy in his underwear on the billboard, it's not like, oh man, I got to make sure I don't look at this. It's just like, you don't care. There's no desire there. It's not a natural, normal thing. And the Bible says, there hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. Okay, so the Bible says that, you know, what you're tempted with, and he's talking to Christians in Corinth. And he says to these Christians, he says, there's no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. He's saying, hey, you're not the only one that has these temptations. It's common to man. But being tempted with another man is not common to man. Being tempted with animals or children, no, that's not common to man. That is not a natural sinful desire that you're born with. That is something that's totally against nature because the, the natural man, the normal man, okay, and when I say normal, I mean the one that has not been turned over to a reprobate mind, according to the Bible in Romans chapter 1, the natural normal man uh, does not have these desires toward the same gender, okay? And when a man, if, if a man were to walk up to him and touch him inappropriately, you know, he's going to be repulsed by that. He's going to be grossed out by it. If he's exposed to homosexuality, it's going to gross him out. Now, the media, Hollywood and TV is working to desensitize you to that and get you used to it to where you're comfortable with it. But naturally, you're not comfortable with it. And so that's what I mean by the fact that it's not natural, it's against nature. And it's only a person who reaches a point, and in Romans chapter 1, the Bible talks about a person who you know, rejects the truth, rejects the Lord Jesus Christ, and gets to a point where God basically gives them up. And he uses that term three times. It says he gives them up, he gives them over, he gives them up. And he basically gives them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. And not convenient means they don't come naturally, okay? And uh, if you think about animals, they do homosexuality. Animals will do a lot of really dirty, unsanitary things that humans will not do. They'll throw up and then they'll lick up their own vomit. They'll, 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 they'll lick their own private parts. They'll, they'll, they'll eat excrement and stuff like that, okay? Well, a human being is grossed out by that kind of stuff. But see, when God gives them up and gives them over, the Bible says, you know, they basically become like an animal, 
where they don't have the normal restraint of a human being that's made in the image of God and it just causes them to go after all kinds of other animalistic, strange flesh. And, and Asa did that which was right in the eyes of the Lord, as did David his father. And he took away the Sodomites out of the land and removed all the idols that his fathers had made. You know, the Bible's really clear on salvation. It's not based on how good you are. A lot of people think they're pretty good, you know, and yeah, they're going to get to heaven because they're pretty good. But the Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The Bible says, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. I'm not righteous, you're not righteous. And if it were our goodness that would get us into heaven, none of us would be going. Because the Bible even says in Revelation 21, 8, it says, But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and sorcerers and whoremongers and idolaters, and listen to this, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. I've lied before. Everybody's lied before. So we've all sinned and we've done stuff worse than lying, let's face it. We all deserve hell. But the Bible says, But God commanded his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And so Jesus Christ, because he loves us, came to this earth. The Bible says he was God manifest in the flesh. God basically took on human form. He lived a sinless life. He did not commit any sin. And of course, they beat him and spit on him and, and nailed him to the cross. The Bible says that when he was on that cross, he himself bare our sins in his own body on the tree. So every sin you've ever done, every sin I've ever done, it was as if Jesus had done it. He was being punished for our sins. And then, of course, they took his body when he died. They took his body and buried it in the tomb. And his soul went down to hell for three days and three nights, Acts 2.31. Three days later, he rose again from the dead. He showed unto the disciples the holes in his hands. And the Bible's really clear that Jesus did die for everybody. It says that he died not for our sins only, but also for the sins of the whole world. But there's something that we must do to be saved. The Bible says, it has that question in Acts 16, what must I do to be saved? And they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved in thy house. And that's it. He didn't say join a church and you'll be saved, get baptized and you'll be saved, live a good life and you'll be saved, repent of all your sins and you'll be saved. No, he said believe. And even the most famous verse in the whole Bible that's written on the bottom, I mean, the, the reference is written on the bottom of the cup at In-N-Out Burger. I mean, it's so famous. Everybody's heard of it, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And everlasting means everlasting, means forever. And Jesus said, I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. The Bible says in John 6, 47, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me hath everlasting life. So if you believe on Jesus Christ, the Bible says you have everlasting life. You're going to live forever. You can't lose your salvation. It's eternal. It's everlasting. Once you're saved, once you believe on him, you're saved forever. And no matter what, you can never lose your salvation. Even if I were to go out and commit some awful sin, God will punish me for it on this earth. If I went out and killed somebody today, you know, God's going to make sure I get punished. I'm going to prison or, or far worse or the death penalty. Whatever this earth punishes me and God's going to make sure I get punished even more. But I'm not going to hell. There's nothing I could do to go to hell because I'm saved. And if I went to hell, God lied because he promised that whoever believeth in him has everlasting life. And he said, whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. That's why there are a lot of examples of people in the Bible who did some really bad stuff, yet they made it to heaven. How? because they were so good? No, it's because they believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. Their sins are forgiven. Other people who may have lived a better life in the world's eyes, or maybe even really they lived a better life, they don't believe in Christ. They're gonna to have to go to hell to be punished for their sins. And let me just close on this one thought. One thing that I wanted to be sure and bring up today is that there was a question that was asked to Jesus by one of his disciples. And that question was this, are there few that be saved? That's a good question, right? I mean, are most people saved? Or is it few that are saved? Now, who here thinks that most people are going to heaven? Most people in this world are going to heaven. Yeah, guess what the answer was? He said, in Matthew 7, for example, he said, enter ye in at the straight gate. 
He said, because wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat, because straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. And then he went on to say this. He said, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. And so you see, there are people out there. First of all, the majority of this world doesn't even claim to believe in Jesus. Thankfully, the majority of this classroom claims to believe in Jesus, okay? But the majority of the world does not claim to believe in Jesus. But God warned that even amongst those who claim to believe in Jesus, even amongst those that call him Lord, many will be saying to him, what if, oh, Lord, we did all these wonderful works, why aren't we saved? He's gonna say, depart from me, I never you. That's why, that's because salvation is not by works. And if you're trusting your own works to save you, if you think you're going to heaven because you've been baptized, or if you think you, well, I think you have to live a good life. I think you have to keep the commandments to be saved. I think you have to go to church. I think you gotta, you know, turn from your sins. You know, if you're trusting in your works, Jesus is gonna say to you one day, depart from me, I never knew you. You have to have all your faith in what he did. You have to put your faith in what Jesus did on the cross when he died for you, he's buried and rose again. That's your ticket into heaven. If you're trusting all the things, oh, I'm going to heaven because I'm such a good Christian and I do all these wonderful things. He's going to say, depart from me. And notice what he said, depart from me, I never knew you. Not I used to know you. Because once he knows you, remember I mentioned this earlier, it's everlasting, it's eternal. Once he knows you, you're saved forever. But he's going to say, depart from me, I never knew you. Because if you go to hell, it's because he never knew you. Because once he knows you, he knows you. It's just like my children will always be my children. You know, when you're born again, when you're his child, you'll always be his child. You may be the black sheep of the family. You know, you may be uh, somebody who gets disciplined by God heavily on this earth. You can screw up your life down here, but you can't screw that up. You know, you're saved. It's a done deal. And so that's the main thing that I wanted to present to you about the end times. And we do have just a few minutes for uh, questions about either uh, salvation or about the end times.